Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Devin Minima, who is the uh, candidate for the Solani, Solana, Solano <laughs> oh, County 4th District <laughs> Board of Supervisors, as well as uh, City Councilman in the City of Dixon, John Cameron, Development Officer at Pacific Legal Foundation and author of Rekill, Rewire, and the Upcoming Aristocracy, which is the, the, the third part of the, uh, of the trilogy. Yes. You're going to be just like uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, right? Uh, my Except books better. are shorter. Oh, shorter, I see. Okay. Uh, Devin, you are uh, uh, running for Solano County Board of Supervisors. You're already on the Dixon City Council. Uh, update us, which district? Is it partisan, nonpartisan? Uh, what, what, what party registration and political philosophy do you uh, aspire to? Go on. Well, absolutely. Um, I'm running for uh, Supervisor County District 4. Um, which is uh, Vacaville, Dixon, and uh, all the Allendale area <coughs> north to Poudre Creek, uh, which is all along the I-80 corridor uh, up here between San Francisco and Sacramento. Um, it is a nonpartisan election. Uh, I am a registered Republican, and uh, I, I am definitely a, a Liberty Republican. It, you could uh, say I'm with the RLC, and uh, I came up through Young Americans for Liberty, and uh, they were the uh, impetus that got me moving into politics. So uh, it, it, it'll be a very close race. I'm running against a 16-year incumbent. Um, but of course, last time around, he only won with, uh, well, less than 51%. So uh, it'll Who be a very Who was he running against race. last time? Well, it was a uh, three-candidate split. Okay. Um, so because Solano County has a weird system, basically, um, if anyone gets over 50% in the primary, uh, that's it. There's no runoff. Right. Um, so for that race, there were three uh, non-incumbent candidates running against him, and they totaled 49.1 percent. Okay. Um, and he. So he was able to win in the primary. Exactly. How many yeah. candidates are running this time around? Well, there's four of us again. Okay. <laughs> Me, the incumbent, and two other challengers. Okay. Yeah. And uh, how the other? The, okay, the incumbent is what a Democrat? Do we know? Uh, he's actually a Republican as well. He just okay. doesn't vote like it. So, <laughs> oh. so a rhino Republican, is that what you're telling me? Exactly. Okay, exactly. and the other two candidates are? Uh, Democrat and one is uh, no party preference. Okay. So Socialist. Geez. No, I don't know. I won't say. Okay, okay so, so uh, uh, are you polling? Do you know what, what your chances are at this point? Absolutely. So, yeah, um, of course, in Dixon, we have the hometown advantage, and we're, we're doing pretty good so far. Um, and really, right now, we're just making incursions into Vacaville and trying to get the get the votes up in there. So, slow but sure, we're making progress. We're done canvassing South Vacaville, and we're moving on to the north side. What are the issues in the campaign? Well, so the overburdensome uh, regulation is is by far one of the biggest ones. Um, and is your is the incumbent a part of that problem? Absolutely. Uh, he votes yes on pretty much anything the staff recommends to him. And in local government, uh, <laughs> that's about the worst thing that you can do uh, because the, the people who are profiting the most are, of course, writing the policies. Um, one of the big things that I had to fight when I got elected to city council was making sure that city staff drafting legislation and making recommendations did not automatically default uh, warrant passage uh, with the rest of the council. Uh, and that's why I had to vote against uh, several uh, employment agreements and, and uh, well, lots of policies, tax hikes, fee increases, uh, to make sure that I made it clear you're not going to get my vote just because you recommended it. Well, the city council, and <coughs> I'm assuming that's a part-time job, or at least it's treated as a part-time job <laughs> by its incumbents? Yeah, exactly. So you have a tendency, I would guess, for uh, people who are city council people in situations like that to be overly reliant on the experts, mm -hmm. the people who, uh, the, 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 the staff, the the, uh, the, the, the bureaucratic uh, uh, people who have been there for a long time and, and you know, know where all the bones are buried. Exactly. Well, and I think one of the things that uh, my, my constituents in my district have, have come to really appreciate is that I took what, uh, at the bare minimum, is two meetings a month and turned it into a 20-hour week job. Um, because that's, if you want to serve your constituents correctly, that's what you have to do. And in fact, before I got elected, there really was no concept of constituent service for a city councilman. Uh, you, you didn't have uh, a, uh, a regular expectation of, if I have a problem, I will come to this person or I will come to his intern and, and, and you know, we'll take down notes of what's, what the issue is and then we'll make sure that it gets to the city and gets to the proper people and departments. Um, so that, that was a big change. Um, but 
uh, it's been totally worth it, and I think that the constituents of my district definitely appreciate it. And is that something you'll be able to introduce uh, at the county level? Absolutely. And in fact, the, the county level, uh, you actually get a budget to, uh, to do those kinds of things. So you get to have some actual staffers, not, a, not a, a poor UC Davis student who signed on not knowing what he was getting into. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there's actually professional processes for that. Tell me a little, bit, a little bit about the regulatory overburden at the county level. Absolutely. So Solano County has one of the longest health codes in the state of California of all the counties. Um, and what that means is that the, the local restaurants, of course, are, are suffering trying to keep uh, in perfect compliance with this code that is constantly being added on to. And in fact, several of our charities uh, have been shut down at various points. Soup kitchens have been shut down because they were not able to understand the law uh, because there were so many amendments tacked on to the very bottom of the code. And so when you don't have an, uh, uh, an actual revision, you only have amendments. Uh, what happens is there are sections up at the beginning that are completely irrelevant and, and nullified by the amendments at the bottom. And uh, essentially it takes many, a lawyer. How many pages is this code? Oh, at least 150. Okay. Probably more than that. <laughs> okay. But I haven't taken the time to actually count them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so it's, uh, it's a, the kind of a, a situation where even if you are uh, conscientiously making your best effort, exactly. it's very difficult to not run afoul of, of one of the amendments or one of the provisions in the health code. Absolutely. And our planning code is the exact same way. Uh, in Dixon, what I tried to do last <coughs> night was uh, get past a, a consistency clause that would essentially require the city council to review uh, our land use and zoning code every 10 years uh, to make sure that it was compliant with our general plan, which we're required to put out by the state of California. Um, of course, that got shut down because that would have made too much sense and it was against staff recommendations. Um, <laughs> but the, the county has the same situation. The code hasn't been updated. It hasn't been completely revised. There are amendments all over the place littered across the bottom that nullify sections up at the top. And there is no co cohesive portrait of what's allowed to be done where. Uh, one of the laudable things that the Trump administration has done at the federal level is to repeal two regulations for every new regulation that's enacted. Is that something that you would be willing to do at the county level and would you be willing to uh, expand that by saying I will uh, repeal two uh, outmoded or counterproductive laws for every new law that we pass? Absolutely, I love that idea. I think that it's a, it's a great, uh, and it's, it's, it's actually uh, so <coughs> responsible um, an action to see out of this administration uh, that I would love to see that translated down to the, the state and local and county, county uh, governments because it's, it's exactly what we need. There are so many laws on the books that no one elected official is really aware of all that's required in this city or in, you know, in, in one city or in one county. And uh, you shouldn't have to hire a lawyer in order to open your own business in, in, in well, anywhere, um, but especially in Solano County. You know, it's, it's, it's burdensome enough as it is given what California's laws are, and you shouldn't have to, you know, uh, dedicate a full-time staff member to figuring out what you can do and how you can uh, structure your business. One of the uh, cartoon uh, uh, food safety <coughs> uh, ridiculous uh, things is, Lemonade stands getting shut down by uh, exactly. by the by the food police. Is that happening in Solano County? Not to my knowledge yet. Um, but actually, I wrote a, I was uh, doing a syndicated column for a while, and uh, that was one of the uh, topics that I tackled uh, during that time. And it was published across the county. And and uh, it's 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 true. It's it's very disheartening. Uh, to see the, the little remnants of capitalism that we have left <laughs> being cracked down upon. You know, there's nothing more innocent and, and a better learning experience than seeing a kid go out there and try to sell lemonade on a hot summer day. This show is, of course, uh, live on uh, Thursday nights at uh, 8 p.m., noon Friday, and uh, uh, Saturday at 4 a.m. on accesssacramento.org and uh, on uh, at Channel 17 in Sacramento. It's also on YouTube mm -hmm. and on uh, the uh, uh, Internet at Facebook. Uh, so give us your best pitch for everybody that's going to, you know, the thousands of people that are going to, you know, watch this show on YouTube or Facebook. Why should Devin Minima be elected uh, to the uh, County Board of Supervisors? Well, I was born and raised in Solano County, and I truly believe that Solano County can be uh, 
essentially the best of the worst, given that we're here in California. Um, and all it takes is uh, a, a lot of hard work, but going through and identifying uh, what we can do away with and, and, and how we can make it easier to do business in Solano County. And even more than that, appreciating our local businesses as much as we try and go out and chase the big businesses from other counties that are you know, escaping uh, one regulation or the other. Um, my campaign motto for this has been protect, restore, and unleash. And uh, it's all about protecting what we have, restoring what we've lost, the liberties that we've lost, and unleashing our residents so that they can have a better opportunity to thrive in California. <coughs> Boy, that sounds like a libertarian platform if I've ever heard one. Uh, sorry, when... I coughed at the end. Why don't you say that again because I coughed over it. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that last bit was unleash uh, the residents of Solano County so that they can thrive here in California. One of the uh, things that's happening nationwide is uh, people who are registered or who are elected as, uh, as Republicans and Democrats are being uh, uh, convinced that in order to follow their conscience, they need to become libertarians once they're elected. And then they're running for re-election and getting re-elected as libertarians. Laura Abke in Nebraska mm -hmm. is a state uh, a, Cong a state assembly congressperson, uh, or mm -hmm. a state, uh, they only, it's unicameral, so I don't know whether they call themselves senators mm -hmm. or, or assembly people, but, but she was elected as a Republican, running as a, changed her registration to a libertarian and was running for re-election. Uh, the uh, land commissioner, I think it was, in Arizona, uh, mm -hmm. was elected as a Republican and is now a, uh, a libertarian. And we're seeing that happen in New Hampshire, where, uh, where Democrats are uh, crossing over, we're seeing it happen mm -hmm. across the country. Will you be one of the first in California to, uh, to cross that Maginot line and uh, uh, stand up for your true libertarian beliefs? Well, I'll, I'll really start worrying that once I get to a partisan position. Um, but a absolutely, I, I will take that under consideration. Okay, thank you very and much. Uh, I do want to do a quick shout out. I know that Mays Middleton over in uh, Texas just won his primary. Uh, and he's, he is a liberty candidate that is uh, going to do some great work, as well as Jacob Pritchett, who's running for city council in Chandler, Arizona. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, and uh, he'll, he'll make a great councilman if he can get there. So absolutely help those Liberty candidates out. <laughs> Regardless of label. Exactly. All right. Exactly. John Cameron, tell us about the three or four most interesting new cases since I uh, have vacated the premises at Pacific Legal Foundation. <laughs> well, I, I talked about one. Um, on another show. Okay. But I think I think rather than talk about three or four, I'll talk about uh, two. Um, one is a first a first amendment issue, and uh, it is uh, Minnesota Voters Alliance v. Mansky, um, and it's in obviously Minnesota. Well, it was in Minnesota. It was heard by the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, one of our brilliant young attorneys uh, uh, brought the brief. Uh, should I mention him by name? Um, well, you can say Wen Fa. Wen Fa. Okay, yeah. All right. Yeah. And then one of our other brilliant Wen no Wen Wen Kong Fa Wen Fa. Anyway, I think said, giving him three attaboys is probably enough. Yeah. And then um, Dave Bremer mm -hmm. argued the case. Uh, Dave Bremer's got an awful lot of experience in in front of uh, some pretty highfalutin judges. I think it was his first Supreme Court case, but. Um, and in this case, what happened in, in Minnesota? Minnesota had a law in its books for probably about 100 years. And it said that um, the, the, uh, at a polling station, that, that the uh, judges of the, the polling judges, I don't know, judges of the poll, I don't know, whatever they're called, um, could take a look at, at uh, what people were wearing, buttons or clothing or anything else, and make a decision whether that was uh, politically uh, reaching out, making people uncomfortable at the polling place. And if so, they were allowed to uh, stop people from voting until they um, changed their attire, took off their button, their hat, their t-shirt. So um, strangely, although this is not a point that was made in any of our cases, but it's an observation I'm gonna make here. Strangely, um, that law wasn't enforced until 2010 when the Tea Party movement was really ripping along. Mm -hmm. So um, a, uh, a gentleman, um, quite frankly, I forget his name because it, it's late for me, um, walked into uh, the organization wearing the Gadsden flag and a, and a Tea Party um, logo 
on his the, shirt. The, the, the snake, don't tread on me. Uh, the yeah. gas and flag is don't tread on me, and it had a Tea Party logo in it. <coughs> and a, excuse me, a uh, button that said, please ID me. So <laughs> uh, the, the uh, person uh, at the poll said, no, you can't uh, wear that here. Uh, you're going to have to, uh, we, we can't let you vote with that on. So he was prevented from voting for four hours um, because of wearing a T-shirt that said, didn't say vote Tea Party. It didn't say vote Republican, vote, uh, you know, vote fascist, vote anything. It simply said, you know, uh, please ID me. And, and it had the Tea Party logo against the flag. So... Um, the fact that, that uh, volunteer judges at local polling places, these aren't paid professionals. These aren't uh, people who are um, lawyers, cognizant of the law, any rules or regulations, make this choice, made this choice in, in Minnesota, uh, spur of the minute. And um, so Pacific Legal Foundation filed suit, and the Supreme Court heard the case, and uh, one of the justices asked the attorney representing the, uh, the government, Said so. Tell me, you know, what would pass muster and what would, you know, for example, would uh, would a uh, uh, t-shirt that said uh, "Move on" dot org be allowed? No. Would a t-shirt that said uh, "Tea Party" be allowed? No. Would a t-shirt that had the Second Amendment printed on it be allowed? No. Why is that? Well, there's always something on the ballot about gun control in Minnesota, so it wouldn't be appropriate to have that on there because it might influence somebody's vote or make them uncomfortable. Oh, and then the judge said, well, what about the First Amendment? Would that be okay? And the court broke down in laughter, and, and, and the guy had to say, yeah, that, that, that would be okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, what's, what's happened is that this... This not only is it a regulatory state, but but you know these minor little these laws seem to be minor. But when when voting margins are so slim in places, that the over and over they ask this kind yeah, of question. Yeah, there was a a race. Speaking of slim races, in, in uh, Pennsylvania, it yeah. was, uh, there was a, a vote that was decided by six hundred in favor of the Democrat, and I might add, thirteen hundred people voted for the Libertarian in that race. Cool. And uh, does does Pennsylvania have voter ID? I have no idea. Oh, yeah, because there's a strange correlation between voter ID and lack thereof, and never mind. So um, they they asked the, the, the government lawyer a number of other questions. They said, so how, who decides if one person thinks it's okay and another doesn't? Well, the, the head judge of the you know polling place. Oh, mm -hmm. and what kind of training do they have? Well, they're, they're trained. You know, what kind of legal background? Well, they're, they, you know, they're trained. So um, some further questions were asked, and they said, so if what happens if... Uh, People got together prior to the polling place and organized themselves through social media or some other way and said that uh, wearing a white t-shirt represents some political organization. Would the white t-shirt be allowed? No. <laughs> so it, it was pretty crazy. And um, the, the, uh, the Supreme Court justices asked some you know, pretty difficult questions. Um, and, and I think uh, it'll, the, the problem is that a number of states have similar laws on the books. And, and Minnesota had this law in the books for, for 100 years, but didn't pursue it, strangely enough, until Tea Party became popular. But, you know, there are stories where they, where they, they ejected people for wearing moveon.org and, and, you know, the pink hats and all the rest of that. Whether they're true or not, there are stories from around the country that people on both sides of the political spectrum and then the correct side, libertarian and in the middle. Were, were ejected from polling places for wearing political apparel, whatever that might mean. So um, the other case I want to talk about is not as, as fun and it is a little bit uh, more technical, but it could actually have a huge impact on the lay of the land in the United States. And it's called, and it's, and it's a quirky little case. It's called Nick v. Hamilton Township, or Scott Township. All right, the other one, okay, I got it. Hamilton is the next part of the case I'm going to talk about. This, this little old lady, literally, in Pennsylvania bought a farm, 90 acres. And um, the, um, in Pennsylvania, they have lots of, of, uh, of graveyards scattered around old farm plots. There's piles of stone that could be a grave. You know, there's, 
there wasn't a lot of centralized, you know, cemeteries, and 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 people were were loud as anyone should be, you know, to bury people on their property. So uh, um, Scott Township um, decided to pass a law stating that uh, any time during daylight hours, anybody who wanted to could go on to um, um, this this woman's Nick, Miss Rose, Rosemary Nick, I think Rosemary Nick, um, her property, uh, because one of their inspectors had decided that a pile of stones on the property might be a grave. This is despite her no trespassing signs, despite her fence, despite the fact that she has animals, despite the fact that she has, you know, it's probably not a working farm, but in violation of every property right you can think of. But that's okay, because there might be dead people there. Or there might be a fence that fell over and looks like a grave. So what this poor woman did was she tried to pursue her claim, uh, since this was Scott Township, um, in federal court, because it's, a, it's an entity that is protected by Pennsylvania state government. It's a township. Obviously, the state is going to protect decisions made by the township. And, and because of another case that was decided 33 years ago, which is... Um, Williamson County v. Hamilton Bank. The Supreme Court, in its infinite wisdom, decided that before somebody can buy, bring a taking case for property, almost any other case can be taken directly to federal court. But a taking case for property has to pursue all remedies in state court and exhaust themselves through various levels of state court before they can apply for help from the federal court. So after you've spent all your money, you go to federal court and say, well, federal court, will you take a look at this? And the federal court frequently turns around and says, and I didn't know this until recently, when one of our other brilliant attorneys, last name I think Schiff, um, first name could be Damien, clued me in that many times when, when that case actually gets to federal court, instead of eagerly saying, oh, we, give a, we, we have a chance to redress a wrong you know, we just wish that that Williamson County case wasn't in existence so we can help you against the state. Oh, what, you don't have any money? Well, hold on. You've argued this case at three different levels in the state and lost. We think this case has been fully adjudicated. We're not going to see it. So really, in property rights and almost property rights alone, the federal government really makes property owners guilty until proven innocent and makes them exhaust themselves throughout the state process before they appeal with very little likelihood of acceptance to a federal court. Mm -hmm. So um, Dave Bremer, um, the, the brilliant attorney who, who argued the uh, MVA v. Mansky, uh, has been filing petition after petition over the, over the last, I think, I don't know, 20 years, 13 years, 15 years. Uh, he has his heart set on, his mind set on doing what is right and overturning Williamson County. And the Supreme Court, uh, has been signaling that that uh, Williamson County needs another hard look, and and it uh, there were four or five points of law in the case that we brought and asked the Supreme Court to look at. They said that they would only hear the case as it relates to the Williamson County ruling. Now, what this is going to mean, readers, and I know I went off on what sounds like legal, literally tens of thousands, perhaps even more people every year. If you talk to a good lawyer in your state. They're going to tell you not even to bring a taking case against the state because you will have no likelihood of success. They'll tell you to bring a due process case or a First Amendment case or some other case. Then you'll have some likelihood of success. But quite frankly, don't pay me the, what do you pay that lawyer? 800 bucks an hour to try to take this case because you're going to be wasting your money. So really, this wrong has, has, has been crushing property owners in this country since 33 years ago. And hopefully the brilliant attorneys at Pacific Legal Foundation with perhaps uh, a Supreme Court that now has a, a much better understanding of the Constitution than it did before um, will right this wrong. Sorry it took a long time to explain that one, but it's a hugely important case. It'll have repercussions that are, that are just phenomenal. And since the property rights, your, your rights to property is probably the most fundamental right and to not, when the state or an entity of the state or a city, a county, a township, the state itself, I mean, takes it away from you, not being able to, to appeal to the federal government to help you is, is horrible. And hopefully 
this this case will write that ruling. It'll be interesting to see whether to see what the uh, the Supreme say about that. Yes. Um, Ballot Access News recently came out with a, uh, uh, in their March issue, came out with a, a, uh, a study that shows that the voter registration over the last 10 years has changed remarkably. Libertarian Party registration has increased by 92% at the expense of Republican and Democratic uh, nom uh, registration, which has gone down 5-10%. Uh, Nineteen percent is the increase for other third parties and independents, mostly independent voters uh, registration. Um, the uh, the upshot of all of that is that there seems to be something going on. People are really getting tired of voting for the tired old duopoly of establishment Republican, establishment Democrat, and not seeing anything change at all. That explains the uh, the Trump election, I think. People were voting against mm -hmm. the establishment. It explains the Ron Paul uh, limited success back in 2008, 2012. Mm -hmm. It explains even the Bernie Sanders, uh, Sanders uh, <coughs> appeal in the 2016 election. Uh, thoughts? Sorry folks, cold. Thoughts on whether that's going to progress? Um, I think it, it can't help but progress. I, I am actually um, quite pleased. I spend a lot of time in, on weekends in coffee houses writing. And uh, I chat with staff and, and, uh, and other people. I, I, like, I like people, I like to talk to them, find out what they think, you know, preach a little bit about libertarian philosophy, try to sell a book or two while I'm there, you know. Uh, steal their conversation and put it in my book and claim it as my own, uh, that sort of thing. So um, th these young people are, are making coffee at coffee houses and they have biology degrees. Uh, they've been, you know, they have a, a master's in some kind of therapy or something. And they're making coffee because jobs don't exist. Mm -hmm. they, they are saddled with a huge amount of, of uh, uh, student loan debt and, and can't get a job in their field unless they move to North Dakota or something like that, which people used to do in this country, but they're apparently not doing anymore. They know they've been lied to. They know that that Social Security tax that comes out of their check, well, they will never see any of that. They know that the $20 trillion in, in debt, might be 21 by the time we're talking, will never get paid off. It's going up a trillion a year with the tax cuts and the, and the yeah, spending yeah. increases at this point. Well, so they know they've been lied to. Now, they, they fall on two sides of the spectrum. It's, it's amazing you know, how many people still fall into the old socialist category. But uh, there's a lot of libertarians out there, folks, and more every day. And we'll continue to encourage that uh, on Libertarian Counterpoint, www.accesssacramento.org, on your uh, internet, on uh, TV in Sacramento, Channel 17, on YouTube, and on Facebook at, uh, uh, at Libertarian Counterpoint uh, site on, on Facebook. Thank you very much for being part of the show.